That's in Matthew. Matthew chapter number 26. I know that there may be times we come and we look at um, scriptures, I, and I just felt led tonight that I just really want to look at um, at the beginning of this year, tonight in the service, just looking at Calvary. Calvary, we get so busy with so much in life um, that I don't want to take my focus off of Calvary and off the cross. So in Matthew chapter 26, verse number 47, I was speaking with a friend and uh, we were talking about the importance of knowing the Lord and how important it is to, uh, to, to be saved and to have uh, an experience at Calvary. And then I, I believe that we need the Holy Ghost. I believe that we need to be walking in the Spirit and that we need revival. But I believe that the object of our faith should be the cross. Amen. There should be something that is dear to us about the cross, about the crucifixion, about the power of the blood of Jesus Christ, the victory that came through Jesus and His working upon the cross. As I was talking to this individual, he was sharing with me how that he had ran into a, a, a former classmate and uh, uh, it was a female, and uh, uh, he said, well, hey, how about we, uh, she said, I'm a, I'm a pastor. How about we get together? How about we talk? And uh, she said, okay. Uh, so they got together, and he said, I want to hear about your, your conversion. I want to hear about uh, what God has done for you. And she said to him, she said, well, uh, you know, this is my situation. Uh, my dad got sick. My dad died. And I realized that in, in, in life it's short. He said, well, what was the marker? Uh, what, is, what is that moment that you got saved? And she said, well, I'll tell you the moment that I got saved is when I left my husband and I finally found freedom. He said, that's not salvation. She said, it is for me. You're a pastor? What is salvation? Amen. It's a moment where we accept the work of Jesus Christ upon the cross. It's nothing that we've done, but it's because of what He's done. The Spirit of God draws us. Our hearts are convicted. We place faith in the work of Jesus Christ and what He did on the cross. We put faith that He's sitting on the right hand of the Father making intercession for us. And we ask Him to come into our life. We confess that we are sorry of every sin and every wrongdoing, every uh, injustice that we've done against the cross, against the holiness of God. We ask Him to forgive us and to come into our life. And in that moment, God comes by and He gloriously delivers. Amen. You know that you know that you've laid it by faith at the cross of Calvary, that place where burdens are surrendered, amen, that place where burdens are lifted, amen, that place where Jesus Christ takes and writes our name by His blood in the Lamb's book of life, amen, and says uh, to God, this one is with me, amen, aren't you glad for salvation tonight? Amen. I'm not looking to go to church and be involved in something uh, that, that, that looks religious. Religion has mired God. Religion doesn't let God in. But all oh, when we get saved, it will change our lives. Amen. And Jesus Christ will deliver us and set our feet on a new course that is charted by Him. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. So I just want to look at tonight, amen, uh, uh, that, that, that which wrote our names in the Lamb's Book of Life. That that brings us back by the cross that we visit that place where burdens were rolled away. That place where we visit where Christ gave all for us. So I, I really just tonight, it, it, I want to journey through the Word of God and look at it. I want to look at this thought. I want to look at the worst day for the best day. The worst day for the best day. My mom said something to me all the time growing up when we went through hard times. She would say, better days are coming. Amen. 
Let our hands come. How many of you have ever before, you know, you, you, you work hard, uh, whatever it is, maybe you save money, you purchase a home, a car, maybe you go on a vacation, but in the middle of all the hard, uh, laborious uh, tasks that you are doing, you find that those worst moments pay off for the best moments ever. Amen. Uh, sometimes we have to look at it that way in life. Those things that we are going through, the worst, amen, that will be turned into the best. And so we find here in, in, in Matthew chapter number 26, I want to start reading really at verse number 42. The Bible says, And he went away again the second time and prayed, My father, if this cup uh, may pass away from me, uh, except I drink it, your will be done. Amen. He was struggling with, with, with doing the worst feat he ever had done. It was like he had been misrepresented. Jesus misunderstood. Uh, there had been things and loss that he had gone through. And, but, but the worst thing was to know that he was going to drink of that bitter cup of sin. The one who knew no sin would drink about it for us. And, and the Bible says, in verse number 47, and while he yet spake, lo, Judas, one of the twelve, uh, here he is, he comes and, and, and he finds Jesus and, and with him a great multitude with swords and staves from the chief priests and the elders of the people. Can I tell you the chief priests and all these, these religious people, they have always tried to kill what God wants to do. Religious people kill what God wants to do. God-loving people promote the kingdom of God. I don't want to be religious. Amen. I want to have a relationship with God. I want to promote the kingdom of God. I, I don't want to just live by philosophy or a set of laws or tradition. Amen. That kills religion. But relationship revives relationship with God. And the Bible says, Now he who betrayed him gave them a sign, saying, Whomsoever I shall kiss, the same as he. Hold him fast. One of the most, and, and is the most betraying moments in all of history, when Judas was scared. This is Jesus. I want you to imagine you've probably been betrayed before. Someone has hurt your feelings. Someone has betrayed you. I felt that before. But I've lived a life that's not perfect. Here's the one who's lived perfect. And yet he's betrayed. Talk about an injustice. Going down the portals of history the worst injustice that is ever done. And forthwith came Jesus and said, Hail, Master, and kissed him. And Jesus said unto him, Friend. Jesus wasn't being sarcastic. Jesus wasn't being mean. Jesus was showing his love even when the greatest of sinners fail. And in the most betraying moment of time, that God still loves and God still forgives. That's the message of the cross. That's the message of a Savior. God still loves in the worst of injustices done against Him. God still loves. Do you understand tonight? That one that we're praying for that seems to be straying farther and farther away. That one that seems to have a deaf ear to God. Even uh, we can look at our lives and see maybe where we've had those moments. But God still loves. Amen. He's a friend of sinners. He desires relationship. And the Bible says that they came and they laid hands on Jesus. And they took him already in their heart, murderous actions. And behold, one of them which were with Jesus stretched out his hand. We know that it was a, a Peter. And, and he struck this, this, uh, this, this uh, struck uh, a servant of the high priest and smote his ear off. The Bible says, jumping on down to verse number 57, when they had laid hold upon Jesus, they led him away to Caiaphas, the high priest. And elders, uh, where the scribes and the elders were assembled, 
But Peter followed them afar off. And unto the high priest's palace, and we went in and sat with the servants to see the end. Here Peter is a ways off. The story progresses on in the verse number 69. For the sake of time, I want you to imagine the worst day ever. His disciples couldn't even wait and tarry with him in prayer. He surrenders his will to the will of the Father, that Gethsemane experience, where he says, not my will, but thy will be done. I believe that that's one of the most difficult prayers that we as believers will ever pray. Not my will, but thy will be done. When you're standing at a bed of a loved one, when things aren't going the way that you have already preconceived, when life is what it is and you say, not my will, but thine be done, realizing that we don't have control over anything in life, but God is in control. And in that moment where we really do take our hands off the will, we surrender to God, and we say, God, not my will, but yours be done and accomplished. And that's a mighty big prayer, folks. I don't know if you can join me and you can understand, but when we say to God, not my will, but thine be done, that place of surrender where we walk through, where we tear down, where we give to God, God, this is for you. Amen. That moment where you give that child to God, that moment where you give your health to God, that moment where you give your life to God, amen, that moment where you surrender your finances and everything about your life, you just say, God, not my I will, but time be done. I, it's a tough moment. Because we don't always see. Faith says trust. So here it was, if it hasn't already been bad enough, he's betrayed by the one that he loves and his friend, and he still loves him regardless of the betrayal. Now we find that somewhere in obscure places in the shadows, Here's Peter, and he's following along, but not real close. And so, uh, 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 verse number 69, the Bible says, Now Peter set, set without the palace, and the damsel came unto him and, said, and says, You you, you were with Jesus of Galilee. And, and what does Peter, no, 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 not me. Seeming like the worst day ever. And again, he moves to the porch, and this 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 uh, is said to uh, you, you 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 were with Jesus, and the Bible says that after a while he 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 he, he, he uh, of denying Christ there that, that that third time that he began to swear. The Bible says it wasn't like a swear word like maybe we would think in our mind of profanity, but it would be like swearing. You know, I promise you, I pro no no, I can do that. I do not. The Bible says, and then Peter remembered the words of Jesus. That he said, that before the rooster crows, you'll deny me three times. And he warned me well there. It's a bad day for Jesus. It's a bad day for Peter. Feeling failure. So we find that he sent before Pilate. We read of Judas. He eventually kills himself. Can you imagine? You love someone and, 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 and their betrayal and their denial there in the mixed up confusion of their life. They take their very own life. So just the setting's just not good altogether. Let's just face it, folks. Here were 12 that were together, and it just seems like everything is fly apart. He's brought before Pilate. Pilate. We know uh, that Pilate, as he's there before Pilate, Jesus said unto him, uh, and when he was accused of the chief priests and elders, he answered nothing. Then Pilate said unto him, Do you not hear how many things they witnessed against you? So here there are many witnesses, Brother Craig, but here is this man who lived the most innocent life with the justice of anyone who's ever walked the face of the earth. And he answered him never a word, and so much that the governor marveled greatly. 
And, and as we move quickly on the, uh, through Scripture, we find that finally because of the pressure of the people that, 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 that Barabbas is released. The Bible says, and then uh, released he Barabbas, in verse number 26 of, of Matthew 27, unto them, and when, and when he, or Pilate, had scourged Jesus, he delivered him to be crucified. Let's stop for a moment. I think sometimes we forget about this part. That here he is so badly beaten in his scourging that some people didn't even live through this. If I could, let's reference back to Isaiah chapter number 50, verse number 6. The Word of God says, prophetically speaking of, of, of Jesus, I gave my back to the smiters, and my cheeks to them who plucked off the hair. I hid not my face from shame and spitting. If you bounce back on right over, uh, the Word of God says, I clothe the heavens with blackness, and I make sackcloth their covering, and the Lord hath given me a tongue of the learned. Here it could be that, 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 that he could have stopped all this. He could have stopped it, but he knew that the world needed a Savior. Even on his worst day, he had one for the best day. Folks, sometimes serving Christ will be lonely. Sometimes it will be difficult, but one day we will trade our worst day in for the best day. Amen. So here it is that the Bible says that the soldiers of the governor took Jesus into the, uh, the, the common hall and gathered unto him the whole band of soldiers. And they stripped him, speaking of his outer garment. They, they, they put on him a scarlet robe. There was one that was probably worn by Herod. And they began to mock him. And when they had, had, had flattened a crown of thorns, they placed it upon his head. And, and, and this, this victor's thorn. And they put a reed in his hand. And they, they bowed the knee before him. And they mocked him, saying, Hail, King of the Jews. So here he is. He's been betrayed by his friends. They forgot about him. And he's been misunderstood and misrepresented. And he doesn't even talk because it doesn't do any good. And now he's stripped of his clothes and he has a crown of thorns upon his head. He has a back that is broken open. Thank God for the stripes that was placed upon his back because his worst day makes healing the best day. The Bible says that they spit upon him and then they took that reed and they began to hit him. Can you imagine what Christ bore for you and I? We look at this cross, so it's, it's an emblem of beauty. But for Jesus, it was an emblem of suffering and shame and bearing the sins of the world. His worst day to provide for us the best day. The Bible says. And they came out, they found a man Simon, uh, 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 a man of Serene Simon by name. They asked him to bear that, that beam of the cross that goes uh, horizontal there. And they came unto the place called Golgotha, that is to say, the place of the skull. I may have said this before, but I want you to think about something. This week I've been thinking about this. I had to write a paper. Um, what does sickness mean to you? How do you talk about sickness? You know what sickness means to me as a believer? Sickness is this, that one day God had created Adam and Eve and he placed them in this perfect paradise. He gave them everything that they needed. And said, I want you to obey me. One tree, the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, don't partake of. The enemy is so wicked. He, can, he, he, he lies, he twists, he tells tales. He said, oh, you can eat of that tree. Eve eats, she gives to her husband, Adam. They immediately realize something. They're naked. God puts them on the outside of the garden. And now for the first time ever in a world that is paradise, destruction, death, disappointment, 
begins to spring up. And because of that first Adam, you and I now inherit sin. Sin is inherited of him. Everyone that is born of Adam and Eve, our, 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 the, the mother and father of all the human race, we now inherit that sin. And, and some will make sinful choices. We've all had. And so because of that, our bodies will be affected. Our relationships will be affected, whether it's by that inherited sin nature or because of sin's choices. But thank God for a Savior who bore a bad day that we may have a better day because there's freedom from the curse of sin. Amen. What we've inherited from Adam, now we inherit a, a salvation and righteousness and right living and a relationship with God. What we inherited from Adam of sickness and sorrow. Amen. Now we inherit from the second Adam, Jesus Christ. Amen. Hope and comfort that only comes from God alone. Amen. And so Adam died there. Tradition says that his skull was buried there. It was dug up and fell. But now the second Adam will die there. Amen. It will be the worst day for him. Amen. But it creates the best day for us. Amen. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Amen. The Bible says that they had given him vinegar to drink and mingle with God. They, uh, and when they tasted thereof, he wouldn't drink. And, and, and they crucified him. They parted his garments and cast his lots at the foot of the cross. And, and, and they sat down and they watched him. And they put this accusation above him. This is Jesus, King of the Jews. Yes, it was an accusation of mockery. But nothing could have ever been more true. He is King. He is King. Amen. Whatever more. The Bible says that there were two thieves that, on both sides of him. And uh, they, uh, 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 one on the right, one on the left. And, and when people passed by, they would shake their heads and they would say, you, to Jesus, you destroyed, uh, you said you, you would destroy the temple. You would rebuild it in three days. If you really are the Son of God, then come down off the cross. What they didn't understand was this is a bad day, but there's a much better day coming because of this. What they were thinking of physically, Christ was speaking of them to about spiritually. Amen. If you be the Son of God, come down. He had the power to come down, but He chose not to, to give us a better day. Hallelujah. The Bible says that the chief priests were mocking with the scribes and the elders, and they said he he saves others, but he himself he cannot save. If he be the king of Israel, let him come down from the cross, and we will believe. Would they really believe? No. no. They were mocking and making fun, but they were also liars in what they said. The Bible says that the thieves also which were crucified with him cast the same on their teeth. So at one point, though that one changed his mind and found himself in paradise with Christ, amen, uh, there was, uh, at the beginning he was mocking with the other. The Bible says that about the sixth hour that there was darkness all over the land. When you talk about a bad day, God doesn't have bad days. God doesn't have bad days. But there was one day he did. Could not even bear to see his son take on the sins of all humanity. And there it was in the darkness, not because of an eclipse, not because there was an inclusion of the sun, but simply because God could not see. And he was speaking something by saying that, that God cannot bear to, to, sin, to see sin. I, I, he was speaking that to us in volumes. The Bible says that about the ninth hour, he cried out, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Uh, and so as he says this, he's not asking uh, because of uh, not knowing. He was asking so that you and I would understand, amen, uh, what redemption means to you and I and all of humanity. God himself couldn't be there to see it. Because of this bad day. God makes all of our days better. Hallelujah. 
someone thought that he was calling for Elijah. The Bible says in verse number 50 that when he had cried again with a loud voice, he yielded up the ghost. Something so interesting to me, and I know that we've talked probably about this before, but refreshment to my mind and hopefully refreshment to your mind. That all of a sudden the veil of the temple was rent. That means it was torn. Think about the tapestry of this veil that secluded the presence of God from ordinary man. Brother Doug, 60 feet in length. So 60 feet up. It was so thick, Brother Justin, that they said you could put oxen on four corners of it. And they would go in different directions or attempt to. And they wouldn't be able, Sister Rachel, to tear this veil. But God showed because of the work on Calvary, Sister Sandy, that from the top to the bottom, that He tore that veil because the worst ever created the best ever. And that's what we feel, what we feel tonight. The emotion as we talk about the cross, that's the Holy Ghost, that's the presence of God. That's what we feel when, when we go to God in prayer. We feel His presence because He draws us into His holy place. Amen. And so uh, the worst became the best ever. For the sake of time, I'm going to move very quickly. When we jump into chapter number 28, and the Bible says that in the end of the Sabbath, toward the dawn of the first day of the week, we know the story that there came Mary and the other Mary to see the sepulcher. And behold, there was an earthquake, and the angel of the Lord descended from heaven. And he came and he rolled back the stone from the door, and his countenance was like lightning, and his raiment was as white as snow. And for fear of him, the keepers did shake, the guards that were there, and they became as dead men. Uh, here it is. Uh, they were so frightful. And the angel answered and said unto the women, Don't be afraid. I'm using my terminology. For that with uh, that that you seek Jesus, uh, which was crucified, he's not here, for he's risen. As he said, Come and see the place where he lay. And go quickly and tell his disciples that he has risen from. All of a sudden, Peter has denied him. The disciples, it seemed like they're scattered. There's hope. Because a better day has come. He's alive. It's your life to come to the piano tonight. Tonight, I just want to say this. There is going to be a better day for each of us one day when we make our home eternal with Jesus. But as you're going through days that may seem monotonous, days that you don't understand, days where you surrender and say, God, not my will, but yours be done. I just want to remind you that these are the best days. <coughs> And that there's better days coming. These are the best days because Christ has written our names in the Lamb's Book of Life. These are better days because He lives. Because He lives. Tonight, I just want our focus to be upon the cross. Listen, I don't even care how long you've come to this church or how long you've claimed to be saved. If you don't know a moment in time that you give your heart to God and say, God, come in, cleanse me. To have that experience of knowing your sins has been washed away. I want to encourage you tonight. Have that experience and mark the calendar that you know that your sins has been washed away. Know that in the worst of days, that God is here to make things better. If you're struggling with what's going on around about you, or even in you, 
I want to encourage you tonight to find a place of prayer and say, God, not my will, but yours be done. I think the greatest thing about serving God is we can, we can plan out everything and God can draw things in our life and God can lead us. And sometimes He takes us in turns and roads and journeys that we don't even expect. But when we say, God, this isn't about me, it's about you, we find it becomes a better day. His worst day purchased our better and best day. So wherever you're at in your life, I'm asking you to take a trip to Calvary tonight. Would you bend your knee and bend your heart and allow yourself to be carried away to a cross where everything that the first Adam had lost was restored by the second Adam. And we may have inherited that everything that the first Adam passed on to us. All those bad genes, if you will. But the good news is there is a Savior who had a bad day so that we can have better days. And what we inherited from the first Adam, now by choice. We didn't have a choice with the first Adam, but by the second Adam, we have a choice to inherit better things. Would you come and make your inheritance sure tonight for better days? Let's gather into a place of prayer tonight.